You can turn to Hebrews chapter 10. I will probably begin there as far as the reading of a scripture will be concerned. This morning I want to talk about the Lamb's perpetuity in scripture. I've spoken about the perpetuity of the Lamb from Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 mainly for the past couple weeks. I want to now begin to look at more directly at the Lamb's perpetuity in certain passages and move not on but move on <laughs> if you know what I mean. I don't want to move on from the perpetuity of the Lamb but to move on to other passages. Let me just say beginning this this message this morning. God's book this Bible the scripture is about God's son. Yes, sir. This book is about Christ. Yes, sir. Hebrews chapter 10 and of course this is our Lord Jesus Christ speaking mainly in verse 7 when the apostle had written about all of those sacrifices which were a shadow of good things to come. He says the law having no shadow. And remember the law has a shadow but the law is not shadow. Yeah, exactly. This I think is where some are not quite clear enough. The law is not all types and symbols. No. I mean those commands when God says thou shalt not they mean exactly what they say. Yes sir. And when it says thou shalt they mean exactly what they say. Amen. But we know that that law is given not to show us the way to life. But the law was given to show us the reality of our spiritual death. Amen. But the law also has shadows. Yep. And that's what it says for, in verse 1. For the law having a shadow. But of what? Of what? Good things to come. Yes, sir. And when the apostle defines some of these things, then he actually quotes from the Old Testament. So we have here a truth that was true in the Old Testament, right? Yes, sir. Because verse 7, then said I, this is a quote from the Old Testament. What is it? Psalms, one of the Psalms. I believe it may be chapter 42. I don't remember right off it. My Bible don't have a center reference. But be that as it may, it's a quote from the Old Testament. So this is the apostle here writing that this is valid both in the Old Testament and now. And what does it say? Lo, then said I, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. That's the quote. That's the quote. Now the rest of it's the quote, but yet in the parentheses, look. Then said I, that is who? Christ said this. Yes, sir. Then said I, lo, I come. And then what does it say? In the volume of the book, yeah. it is written of me. Amen. This book is about Jesus Christ. It's not about morality or immorality. It's about Jesus Christ. Exactly. This book is not a book about the law. Because the law had a shadow of good things to come. The law having a shadow. In the volume of the book it is written of me. Now there are those who say, well this, is, this word volume simply means book. Or scroll. Or roll. And it's true that the old Hebrew word meant to stay roll. But there's more here because it also mentions the book, which is what? A roll. And he's not saying in the roll of the roll. The whole point here is this word for volume is this. It means the heading of, a, of the scroll. What they would actually do is when they took a scroll, they would roll it from both ends and they would stick something in it. Sticks, wood of some sort, something, David, in each end. And at the end of each stick was what? The volume. The thing that you held it together with. In other words, what the actual Hebrew word means and actually what the Greek word would mean because this is a quote from the Old Testament. Doesn't matter how people say, well, the Greeks use it this way. Don't matter. That's not the point because the apostle is quoting from the Old Testament, so it's what the Old Testament Hebrew meant. Now, here's what it is it is the highest part, it is the extremity or the end of something. 
That is, Christ is the end, not the finishing part, but he's the end. He's the whole purpose for all of the scriptures. It's all about him. Yes, sir. Whether it is a direct reference to him, whether it is a prophecy of him, whether it is a type of him, or a symbol of him, or a shadow, or a figure. All of scripture is about Jesus Christ. Yes. So much so that when our Lord Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, met up with the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. What does Luke say about it? Let's turn back to that one. Luke chapter 24. And remember, these disciples said, we, we thought this was actually him. Yeah. Him what? Him of whom all the scriptures spoke. Yeah. Every Old Testament believer, I will be so bold as to say, every Old Testament believer was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Amen. Yes, sir. They were looking forward. From the first one, Adam and Eve, first ones, Adam and Eve, to the last ones during Malachi's day. They were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. If you miss that in the Old Testament scripture, you missed everything. But even our Lord said then in verse 25, and this is tough language. Then he said unto them, O fools. He even called his own sometimes what? Yeah. Fools. You know why? Because we are. That's why. Because we are fools and what? Slow of heart to believe. That's valid for me as well as for them. And it's valid for you as well as for me. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe, what? All that the prophets have spoken. Now, what he's talking about, you believe some things. Yeah. But you didn't believe it, what? All. You didn't see all the message. You didn't see the volume of the book. You did not see the purpose of the Old Testament. Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, all not Christ to have suffered these things Amen. and enter into his glory and beginning at where? I would say Genesis. Exactly. Wouldn't you? That's what he's talking about. We talk about Moses. Yes, sir. And beginning at Genesis and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Amen. Of course, this brings to my mind, and probably to yours as well, our Lord Jesus Christ's words when he said to certain Jews, he said, search the scriptures. Yeah. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which do what? They testify of me. Amen. The Old Testament says, if you sum it all up, the Old Testament says, there is one coming. Yes, sir. That's its whole message. Yeah. Even Joe, when it decries the immorality of the day, or more appropriately, of the people, yeah. or even more appropriately, even of God's people. Yes, sir. Right? Even when it decries their immorality and their unrighteousness and their ungodliness, the message of the book was not that. It is one is coming. Amen. One is coming. Job mentioned it. The Old Testament says he's coming. The four gospels says he's here. Amen. He's here. He came. The epistles say here is his word and he's coming again. Amen. That's what they say. That's the whole of the book. Yes, sir. If you miss that about the Bible, or that from the Bible, you do not know what the Bible's message is. Exactly. He is the volume. And another way that, that word was often used, it was the chapter at the head of a column. Now, if you know anything about architecture, when you build a porch with, especially a porch with massive weight, David, you don't just set all that weight on the column. That weight is borne by what? The chapter at the head of the column. You ever seen these big massive houses? And they have a column, and then they put a what? A chapter that does what? It distributes the weight of the building, and it holds the weight. 
Jesus Christ is the weightiest subject that you'll ever find out from in Scripture. If you miss him, you've missed it all. Exactly. No matter what area of scripture we preach from or talk about, if Christ is not all, then he is nothing. Amen. He's nothing. Now, I'm not saying he is nothing, but I'm saying if we, at all of scripture, if we do not see Christ as all, he is nothing to us. But in particular, this book is replete with this one message, that Jesus Christ is God's Lamb. Amen. He's God's Lamb. Even from the very beginning, with the first four inhabitants of the Adamic creation, we find the Lamb being portrayed as in the forefront. Yes, sir. Now let's turn to that, Genesis chapter 4. I have 11 things that I want to try to get through. Whether I will or not, I do not know. So I will not read all of these passages that deal with these 11 areas. That is where we will see the Lamb's perpetuity in Scripture, all throughout Scripture. But I will re begin by reading this one. Genesis chapter 4, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Why does that make a difference? There's only two reasons. One, she'd already had other children, and they were females. Okay? And we have no basis for that. Even if it's true, it doesn't matter. But that's not the point. Why, did, why was it such a blessing to her that she had a what? A male child. That's the whole Hebrew. I have gotten a man from the Lord. Why is that so important? Because she was just previously given a promise that when the seed is come, he will bruise. He will crush, rather, the serpent's head. Amen. That's why it was important. I am of the persuasion that I was, I think, she's wondering, is this him? Exactly. I've gotten a man from the Lord. Why? Because she knew from God's first promise after the fall a man would come. That's right. You see that? Yeah. Exactly. A man would come. The seed of the woman he shall crush the serpent's head. I've gotten a man from the Lord. Now, you know what? He wasn't the one. <laughs> Far from it. But that's not the message. And she again bare his brother Abel. And, and notice how it doesn't, it doesn't say, I've gotten another man from the Lord. She did say that when Seth was born. You can go and read, I'll read on. But why? Why? Because I believe she understood to some degree Cain must have been somewhat of a disappointment to her. <laughs> now, these things that we're about to read about and the reason these two sons, these two brothers are portrayed in the scripture. One, they were, they were reality. Cain and Abel were real individuals. Yes, sir. But what takes place in this account starts out the whole theme of the scripture. Yeah. And the whole point is this. There is every reason for us to believe, though we are not specifically told, there's every reason to believe that Adam and Eve passed on to every son and daughter they had that message, there's one coming. Yeah. Yes, sir. They had every right and the very experience to say, let me tell you where we used to be. Yeah, exactly. But we're not there now. Yeah, that's, right. that's right. And guess why? Because of what we did. Exactly. You know? Yeah. They knew that message, Paul, better than anybody else because there wasn't nobody else. Exactly. And I'm persuaded they passed that message on oh, yeah. to their descendants. Don't you think? Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm persuaded they did. Why, that's why God, that's why, that's why, look, verse 20 of the preceding chapter, Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of what? All living, even that promised seed. But let's move on. She again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of, well, guess what? Sheep, yep. not frogs. Yeah, exactly. Not even pigeons, mind you. 
Not even bulls and goats, mind you. Right? But wait a minute. All of those things were in the sacrifices later on, were they? Not? But here he was a keeper of what? Sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass. Why do you think it came to pass? It came to pass because God Almighty ordained for it to come to pass. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Look, an offering unto the Lord. Yes, sir. Cain knew of the Lord. He knew of Yahweh. He, how did he know that? By this being passed down from his mother and his father. In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel also brought. Right? This lets us know that there was at least a considered equality among the people, the men. But the problem was there was no equality before God in these things. Cain was offering where? To himself? To his mom or his daddy? To his church? To his upbringing? To all? Was he even offering to the message that his mother and father passed down to him? No, who was he offering to? He's offering unto the Lord. And most of us, our minds think, but that's a good thing. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're going to do something, you ought to go ahead and do it to the Lord. Right? Yeah. Now, no one would argue with that except the Lord. Exactly. That's it. There you go. That's it. That's, yeah. Except the Lord. Yeah. And look, and Abel, he also brought, but what did he do? <coughs> of the firstlings. Of the what? The same flock. It lets me know that what Abel brought was what? A lamb. Amen. Now somebody says it doesn't say it. Well, you're totally blind. <laughs> no, seriously. You're totally blind. You don't get it if you miss the lamb here. Exactly. Right? Look. And, and you know, I've heard, that I've heard this preached. I preached on this and I missed this one next phrase. Look. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock. And of the fat thereof. Yeah. Now this is amazing when we consider that God had not yet even instructed anybody according to Levitical law. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yet Abel is bringing a little lamb and he's doing it in a manner that he is offering what? The fat of that little lamb. Now, I'm not going back to it, but you go back to Leviticus and you read through the book of Leviticus and you'll find out one thing belonged to God and God alone when it comes to the sacrifice. Yeah. All the sacrifices, but especially of the lambs, one thing belonged to God. No, sorry, two things belonged to God and God alone. That was the blood and the fat. Yeah, that's right. Why? It is said to be a sweet smelling savor unto who? Yeah. Unto God. Amen. It says the blood and the fat thereof is the Lord's ye shall not eat thereof. Yeah, That's what it says. Yes, and here is Abel. Boy, how lucky he was to have a lamb and some fat. <laughs> huh? No, he was instructed in this. Why? Because this is what God Almighty desired. And you know why? Because this pictured, typified, pointed to his son, the Lamb of God, slain even from the foundation of the world. Amen. But look, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. Now first, he had respect to Abel first. That's right. Before the offering. You know why? Because this wasn't the offering. Yeah. It was just a picture of the offering. Exactly. And let me tell you, Abel knew enough. Now do I have to tell you how he knew that? I really shouldn't have to tell you, but you knew how he knew that. By God's free, sovereign grace. Yes, sir. He knew enough that I have to offer unto the Lord what? Whatever I want? No. Blood and fat. That's right. 
And what's the whole, the whole, the whole connotation here? Abel took that little lamb, or possibly even lambs, okay? He took that little lamb or lambs, and he slaughtered that little lamb or lambs, and he burnt them on a fire. Do you see that? That's the whole connotation of what? And he brought of the firstling of the flocks and of the fat thereof. It was an offering made by fire. Which signifies what? The little lamb was taking the judgment that was due Abel. Exactly. It's the whole point. And he knew that even then. Yes, sir. Do you see that? So much so that it says, but unto Cain and to his offerings, he, he who? Abel? He, Adam? No, that's not the one you, you and I have got to please. That's not the one to whom the offering is made, is it? But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. God cared nothing for what Cain did. It says, it, it, it doesn't say he didn't respect him like he did Abel. It says he had not respect. What's that remind you of? Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Doesn't it? It says he had not respect, and it doesn't say to his offering, it was unto him. Exactly. You see that? Why? Because he had the wrong offering. Yeah. See, if you don't have the right Christ, you're in trouble. Exactly. If I don't have the right Christ, I'm in trouble. Yes, sir. You know, did Cain, was, was Cain really the one that made those vegetables grow, or whatever they were? God Almighty made them things grow. Yes, sir. Mason, he was just giving back to God what was God's already. Yep. The problem was it was bloodless and fatless. That's right. It was no sweet smelling savor to God. Why? Because God Almighty has so ordained it that it takes the blood and the fat to please him when it comes to sin being settled. That's the whole thing. And what does the fat represent anyway? Fat. Well, sometimes the word is used symbolically. And you remember when he told the children of Israel, you're going into the land and you will eat of the what? The fat thereof. What The fat is the choicest parts. It's the best parts. And actually, when you look at the Levitical law, you find not just any fat, but the fat of the choicest parts belong to God. Now, isn't that amazing? You know why? You know why I see that as amazing? Because by God's free sovereign grace, I see Christ. Amen, sir. He is the choicest parts. Amen. So, what does this teach us? Let's just boil it all down. What does it teach us? It teaches us the absolute, the acting. I, I don't even have a better word, and I don't know that we even need a better word. The absolute necessity of the Lamb. Isn't it? Why? Not, bus, not just a lamb. There, there was other flock. There were other sheep. It was a what? A firstling. You see it? Now who was Christ? The firstborn Amen. to Mary. Was he not? This is not coincidence. This is God Almighty, even in that time, in type and symbol, honoring his son. Yeah. This is seeing all preeminence is in the Son. Even then, he didn't come to the earth and then become preeminent. He has always been preeminent. Remember Proverbs 8? Yes, sir. Back before anything, everything that was created, before that, Christ said, I was. And I was daily his delight. That's why this mattered. It wasn't just God picked out something that would matter. It was his Son is him. And he matters. That's what it's all about. Yes, Think of it. Both offered unto the Lord. But Abel offered a little lamb. Get me? A little lamb. It was a blood and a fat offering. And according to Hebrews 11 and 4, it says that it was a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice. He didn't just bring a little lamb in and says, all right, there, Lord, it's yours. No, that lamb was slaughtered. And its whole body and its fat was burned before the Lord. And think of this. Here's the summary of it. God has no respect for people with no lamb. That's it. Yes, sir. None. Exactly. But God's no respecter of persons. Be careful. 
Right here it says he did. Yeah. Is there a contradiction in scripture? No. People just don't know what it means when it says God's no respecter of persons. Exactly. What that means is I don't care if you're a lawyer or a servant. God doesn't care about that. Exactly. But he does care about whether you've got a lamb or not. Amen. That's it. Yeah, you're you see, it doesn't matter whether you're black or white. God's no respecter of persons. That is your own personal person. God doesn't care whether you're male or female. But let me tell you, God cares whether you've got a lamb or whether you've got fruit of the ground. Exactly. It makes a difference with God. And God respects one person and not another when it comes to that. Yes, sir. Now, you remember the passage I quoted to you last Sunday? God seeketh such to worship him. Well, you don't really believe that. Well, you just don't, you don't know what I've been preaching all these years then. But second, there's another illustration of this, and it's a lamb. And times, I said, I have 11. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. I do not have time to read it all. Go back and read it for yourself. What does these verses teach us? What does this passage of Scripture teach us? That God Almighty provides the lamb. Amen. So now we see Abel having a lamb. He was a keeper of the sheep. But now in the next one, the next reference to the lamb, when it comes to a lamb as this particular sacrifice, God lets us know it ain't up to you to choose which one. There you go. Uh-huh. What, what God, or Abraham called the place, the place. Remember, it's Mount Moriah. It's where Abraham was taking Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice to God. He was going to kill that boy. And in his mind, that boy was dead. Yes, sir. And what did, jo what did Abraham call the place? The King James Version calls it Jehovah Jireh. Or more appropriately, Yahweh Jireh. What does that mean? The Lord will provide. Amen. And what did he provide? He provided the sacrifice. Amen. You see, God chose the lamb that he had respect for. It ain't up to me. You get the wrong lamb, you got the wrong offering. Amen. And even our Lord Jesus Christ come along and said there's going to be a lot of false Christ. Yes, Paul come along and said there's going to be another gospel, which in fact is not another, but is a perversion of the gospel of Christ. First thing, a couple things here, quickly. Verse 5, it's the first mention of the word worship in all of Scripture. It's not the first time worship took place. Abel was worshiping God right here when he offered yes, that little lamb. Yes, sir. But here's the first time the word worship is mentioned. And what's it in mention? Abraham says, we're going up to that mountain, me and the lad, and we will worship there. What in his mind was the worship? He was going up there to offer his son as a sacrifice. Yes, sir. Abraham understood that to truly worship God, you must worship him with blood Amen. and with fat. Yes, sir. With, a, with an offering that will be slain. That's right. Even Isaac said, well, Father, here's the wood, which Abraham did cleave, of course. And man did build that cross, didn't he? But who ordained that? Exactly. God did. He clothed the wood. And Isaac said, Father, here's the wood and here's the fire. What's he mean? He didn't mean he had a Zippo. He talked about they had some live coals, some actual burnt wood or whatever, Mason, that they had kept, stored. And Isaac said, said Father, here's, here's the wood, here's the fire, but where's the what? The what? The lamb. That's what he said. Where's the lamb? And what did Abraham say? Well, don't worry about it, son, because we're going to get up there, and I'm supposed to kill you, but when I do, God will do something and, and give me another sacrifice. Is that what Abraham was seeing? No. And the reason I know that's true is because in Hebrews 11, verses 17, 18, and 19, it lets us know Abraham fully intended to kill that boy, and he believed because of the promise God had made to him about that boy having children, God would raise him up from the dead. Yes, sir. Abraham was not expecting that ram. Oh, wait a minute. Ram caught in the thicket. That's right. Wait a minute. It was a ram. Now, there's something. Do you think anything is coincidence or just whatever with God? Abraham said, looked at that boy and said, God will provide himself a lamb. Amen. He did not say God will provide for us a lamb when we get there. That's right. 
Remember, he told them men. He said, y'all stay here. Me and the lad will go yonder and do what? No, no, wait a minute. No, you, you, we'll, go, we'll go what? We'll go go yonder and worship and do what? And return. No, it wasn't because Abraham thought, well, something's going to happen and God's going to give something else in Isaac's stead. No, the Hebrew writer lets us know by inspiration, Abraham understood that boy's a dead boy. I'm going to kill him. But God Almighty raised him from the dead. Yes, sir. Now we see two things here. Two things here. Abraham did not expect a ram. Abraham expected God Almighty himself to be the sacrifice. That's what he said. God will provide himself a lamb. Not he will provide for himself a lamb, but that God, what is he teaching? Here it is. God Almighty will be the lamb. Amen. Abraham knew that. Yes. Now why do you think then it was a ram yeah. instead of just another lamb? Because the ram wasn't the one. Yeah. You see, had God just provided another, a lamb, Abraham could have said, oh, well, there it is. There's the lamb. No, it was a what? A ram. Now, it was a substitute, and therein is a lesson. Yes, sir. But Abraham, and why did you think, why do you think the scripture says they having not received the promise? Yeah. That's what it says. Because what is the promise? Yeah. That seed that would come. The one that Abel knew would be a lamb. The one that even Abraham knew would be the lamb, and he'd be God Almighty himself. Yes, sir. That's what he's saying. I want to tell you something. Did he know of a cross? I have no idea. And maybe not, Mason, but he knew this. God Almighty would provide himself the sacrifice. Amen. He would do the sacrificing. He would be both the sacrificer and the sacrificee. Yes, yeah. That's what he knew. He knew it was going to have to be more than just Abel's little lamb. Yeah. Didn't he? And he knew it was going to have to be more than just some other ram caught in a thicket. Exactly. Now let me move on. God himself would provide himself as the lamb. And that's exactly what Abraham was saying in the Hebrew. Yeah. That's exactly what he's saying. In other words, here's the phrase. Yah Yah Yahweh will see to it that he provides himself as a lamb. Yeah. That's what the word Jehovah Jireh means. Now here we see the necessity of a divine lamb. Yeah. A lamb who is actual deity. Yes, sir. And i got to move on. But now go to the third reference of this lamb. It's what? Exodus chapter 12, which is the what? The Passover lamb. In other words, the whole, if you boil all of that down, that whole Passover account, what is it? Here's the whole phrase. Here it is. And it ain't because I'm that smart. It's just because the book's that full of this truth that you can't miss it unless you're blind spiritually. The whole passage is boiled down to this. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Amen. So that lets me not only is God Almighty going to be the divine lamb, but he's the divine judge who determines what it's got to be. That's right. And he said, promised, when I see the blood, not when you see the blood, exactly. though you will. Sir. But not when you see the blood. Oh, make sure you're all out there looking at it. No, what did he say? Get in the house and hide. That's right. And eat on the very flesh and the bitter herbs, but eat on the very flesh of that lamb whose blood's out there. Well, you can't even see it, exactly. but I can. Amen. And when I see the blood, I, not the death angel. Yeah. Well, I mean, people, men, men are still writing that crazy nonsense when the death angel passed through why because then we don't make God out to be the one that was killing all them firstborn exactly. right let it be the death angel it don't say that God says when I see the blood I will pass over you why because the very one that has to be appeased is the very one who does the judging Amen. he's the judge He's the judge. So now we see the, ne the necessity of the di divine lamb's blood in God's eyes. I see it. I see it. Now Isaiah 52 verses 13 through Isaiah 53 verse 12. <coughs> now we're about to come full circle to a degree. 
Remember, who was the seed was going to be what? The seed of the what? Woman. Yeah. That's us know it was a man, right? But then all of a sudden we realize that this man has to be far more than just some man, right? Abraham said God will provide himself a lamb. But then God Almighty brings us right back in Isaiah 52 and 53 and says this divine lamb is going to also be at the very same time a man. Amen. Go back and read it. I don't have time to go back and read it all. Go back. He's going to be a man. Yes, sir. His visage. God don't have a visage. God is spirit. Exactly. But this divine lamb would have a visage. Yes, sir. You see? In other words, here we come back again. The divine lamb is also a man. How could the lamb be both? He would. Yeah. He just would. Do you think those folks could have answered that question back then? Well, but they didn't have much, as much Bible as we. They didn't have any Bible. Exactly. Much. <laughs> Even in Isaiah's day. Yeah. right? He was kind of Mason in between when it comes to the prophets. But nevertheless, somebody said, how could he be? We don't even know that today. But yet we know the scripture says, and the word, which was with God and was God, and the word was what? Made flesh. He didn't just become, he didn't just take upon himself a human body. He was made flesh. Exactly. And it says, the scripture says, even of this same one, the same one, that he was made sin for us. I cannot define that any more than I can define the word being made flesh. But yet I know it's true. Yes, sir. Jesus hung there on that tree for me. If he did for me, he hung there with all my shame and my guilt and my corruption. Amen. Yes, sir. And yet at the same time, he was still the just one. Yeah. Amen. No personal flaw in his own character, Amen. but he took upon him and in his body all my flaws and corruption and reprobation, everything that's rejected of God. He bore it in his own body on the tree. And he did it even, David, as a man. Yeah. As a man. That's what it tells us. The necessity of the divine lamb's human blood. Because God, after all, doesn't have blood. Does he? That's right. Number five. John chapter 1 verse 29. We already looked at that. What did John say? Behold the lamb. There he is. That's him. Right there. You can look at him. You can see him. This is the divine lamb. Yes, sir. This is both sacrifice and sacrificer. Amen. This is the one who is both offering the offering and the one to whom the offering has been made unto. That's right. All. All of it wrapped up in one. Now here's the thing. And I'm going to have to break this into a couple messages. Ain't I? I'm just on number five. And I, had, I got 11 to go to. In other words, the message here is the lamb is here. Amen. Not another type. Yeah. Not another symbol. Exactly. Not another illustration. Bless God, he's here. Right. There he is in human form. Standing right here in front of me, John says, Behold the Lamb of God, which does what? Yeah. Taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. There's a question. Do we emphasize world and not what he did for the world? We ought to emphasize world. Now, Joe, I know you said he didn't come and he didn't preach all this to the world. Yeah, he did to his world. Exactly. To his world. To the world of his people, he did. Yeah. You see, the whole point, there are people who emphasize, well, he came to take away the sin of the world. Yes, he did. Now, now John was saying, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away. Something that is in the process, but still not absolutely settled. Joe, you just read the verse. It's been settled now. He purged our sins. Then he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Amen. You see that? You see, yes, we must emphasize the world. There's going to be some of every kind upon the face of this earth that God Almighty will ultimately have in glory with him. Yes, sir. That's the world. Male and female both. Yes, sir. We're not Latter-day Saints. We don't believe females come to God through our coattails as men. But they believe that. Yeah. yeah. And we could go right on down the line. Not as a Methodist. And not, you're going to get there through methods. Mm, they ain't going to work. Not as Baptist. You ain't going to get there through baptism. 
Not as Presbyterians, because you're not going to get there, because you have a group of men who can really open up the Word of God to you. Uh-uh. You're going to get there through the Lamb, or you ain't going to get there at all. Amen. And the reason you're going to get there is not because He will somehow, if you let Him, or you help Him, He will take away your sins. No, because He did. Amen. It is, behold, the Lamb of God which taketh a away, away, away. When? When you believe? No, you believe not to get your sins taken away. You believe they have been taken away. Amen. That's the difference in the gospel we preach and the false gospel this world preaches. Exactly. We, they, te they will tell you and me. All kinds of people. God's done all he can do. Now it's up to you. You believe that lamb, you'll perish. You're right. Now, let's not play games. Listen, I'm not being mean. God will not respect anything other than his lamb. And his lamb, according to scripture, has already taken away the sin of the world. That's the message. No, it's take away. And Joe, I'm not even going to read. I had Hebrews 1 verses 1 through 3. You've read that several times to us the past two Sundays. I don't need to read it again. When he had by himself. There it is. Yeah. He, he's there. He's judge, executioner. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he's the offering and he's the offeree. He's the one who, whom is off. He's everything. When he had by himself purged our sins, and Joe said it, he sat down. Why? Because when it comes to that, it's done. It's done. Amen. The gospel is Christ has already done it. Do you believe it? Not he's done everything he could. Now, if you believe it, it'll work for you. Yeah. That's not just a different way of saying it. That's a different gospel. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different message. It's a different God. It's a different lamb. It's a different man. Yeah. That's it. It's not God's, it's not the God man, exactly. the lamb. All right, number six. I may get this done. Acts chapter eight. And let me turn there. I, uh, there's a couple things I want to uh, highlight here. Acts chapter 8. I mean, you, you bear with me just a few more minutes here. <coughs> Acts chapter 8. And look at verse 5. And this is not, this, uh, I'm going to get there. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached the Bible unto them. Is that what it says? Now he did do that. Right? I have no doubt that he did that. Joe, I don't know if he even had a scroll or two with him. I don't know. But he, wasn't, he was preaching from God's word. But what did he preach? He went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Amen. Why? Because that is the message. You miss him. You can see everything else. If you miss him, you missed it all. You got no better than Cain's vegetables and fruits. Right. And God won't have no respect unto you. He never has. Exactly. If that's what you offer to the Lord. And if I can go back and say, I can't go back. I ain't got time. And, 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 and bleed all that right out. All again. He preached Christ. Then look. We know what happened. All of a sudden, Philip is taken way over yonder. I, ain't had, I, I don't know of one preacher today that that's happened to. Like it happened to here. Exactly. You know that? All of a sudden, David, he just appeared in this desert. But guess what? There was one man in that whole caravan that God Almighty was going to send his message to. Now listen to me. And he sent it to him through another man. Yes, sir. Yeah, God spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Adam and Eve, didn't he? But let me tell you something. Yeah, in this last day he speaks to, has spoken to us by his son. But let me tell you something. Jesus ain't going to come and preach to you personally. He's going to send you his truth through another man, through another person. Because that's the way God's ordained it for this age. That's the way it's going to happen. Now, if somebody comes to me and says, but preacher, God came and told me. If he, if he says he told you about this lamb, I'll bow down and say, okay, that's fine. But I ain't met one, David, that has, that'll say, everybody who Jesus came and talked to them at the foot of their bed, when they had that vision at night, they're not preaching this lamb. Exactly. Not a one of them. That's right. Not a one of them. Right. Therefore, if anybody tells me that, I'm going to be highly skeptical, ain't you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You see, I don't care. Here's the point. It don't matter how you got the message if you got the right one, but you better make sure you got the right one. Exactly. You better make sure you got the right one. Look, at, at this Ethiopian eunuch was, was sitting there reading Isaiah chapter 53. Yes, sir. 
and the Spirit of God says, go you join yourself to this whole group and tell them all about Jesus. Is that what it says? Read it yourself. Go join yourself to that man. Yeah. And he walked up. He heard him reading or seen him reading, however it happened. And he said, do you understand what you read? And the Ethiopian eunuch said, I can't unless somebody helps me. I don't know who the, is the, is the prophet talking about himself or somebody else? Yeah. Well, we now know he was talking about somebody else, wasn't he? Look, verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at, that, at the same scripture and preached unto him, what? Jesus. Amen. Jesus. You see, if God has passed over me, then he will reveal that one to me. Amen. Even as an individual. Oh, especially as an individual. Amen. You see that? Here's one man. And let me tell you, even when God saved 5,000 in one day, he saved each and every one of them individually, just like he did this Ethiopian yes, eunuch. Right. You and I, none of us got in because somebody else went in right ahead of us and we held on to them. You will have Jesus Christ and him alone, or you will not enter in. Amen. And God Almighty will come to you individually and reveal to you this one, or you will never know him. Amen. This is the way it'll be. It's the way it is. The Lamb took away my sin. The one who took it away will be revealed to me. Yes, sir. That's what this teaches. Right? Even if it's one man out in the desert in a whole big group of people, if they, 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 they said, yes, he took away my sin, but God also purposed to tell us about it before we end up in glory. Yeah. And if it takes God Almighty taking a man and all of a sudden just transporting him, that's before Star Trek even come along, and he just transported him over here to this desert, why? To preach even to that one man, if need be. That's why it will take place. Why? Because that's the way God's ordained it. Yes, sir. Well, I hope maybe the Lamb was shed that he died for me, and I'll just wake up in glory. It ain't going to happen. Yeah. It ain't going to happen. God's going to send you a messenger, and they're going to tell you about the Lamb, and you're going to believe the Lamb. Amen. And that's the way it'll be. Number seven. Number seven. <coughs> Anybody here like fireworks? I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I do. I like fireworks. You know, you like fireworks. I mean, I take the kids to the fireworks. And we always, as adults, use that as an excuse. You know, Fourth of July. Got to take the kids to the fireworks. I like them. And I'll tell on me and Paul, I'm so idiotic that I left about 8 or 9 o'clock one night, drove all the way to Tennessee to buy fireworks to come back, drove all the way through that night just to have fireworks the next day. I ain't too bright. It's just the way it is. I'm sorry, I know I'm your pastor, you know, but that's just the way it is. But boy, we, pew, pew, it's great, wasn't it? But what, does we, what do we all look for on them fireworks? If you like fireworks, if you don't, that's fine. But when fire, what are you always looking for? Come on, the finale, right? The crescendo. That's what you always look for. It's, pew, pew, oh, okay, that's nice. We're done. Let's go. No, you're waiting for that final bang, bang, boom, when it all goes off, you know, together, massive. Well, let me give you the crescendo. Here's number seven. Worthy, in chapter 5 of Revelation, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Amen. To do what? To take the book out of God's hand. Yes, sir. That's what it says. Yeah. And he's standing. The only two places in scripture. Because yeah. it says he went up there to sit down. There's two places in scripture where it says he's standing though. Remember when, who was it? Stephen was stoned. And in Revelation 5 it says, and there a lamb stood in the midst. Yeah. And he had that scroll. And he has the right to peel them seals back yes, and to have them judgments all start to open up. Yes, Do you see it? see it coming full circle now? This is the crescendo. Why? The lamb is worthy. And Revelation 6, verses 12 through 17, the lamb is not to be trifled with. Amen. Because it is the wrath of the lamb that is coming. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, not the wrath of the one who sometimes is the lamb. It is the wrath of the lamb. Amen. That's the way it says it. Yeah. The crescendo continues. Verse Revelation 7, 9 through 17, the Lamb reigns over salvation. There's 144,000 sealed. Yes, sir. But there's also a great multitude, which no man can number, of every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue. Amen. Isn't that what it says? And it says, salvation to our God and to the Lamb. Amen. See the crescendo? Tenthly, Revelations 15, verses 1 through 4, the Lamb is worshipped. Yes, sir. 
Amen. They sing the song of Moses. This great multitude, this especially the 144,000, but we see throughout all of Revelation, everybody who's redeemed is singing this song. But what do they sing? Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. The Lamb. They sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. And number 11, when this thing's all climaxed, and when God shuts everything down as we know it now and creates a new heaven and new earth, and Mason, it will come down from God out of heaven. Why do I believe that? Because that's what it says. And it's going to come down from God out of heaven. You go back and read Revelation, the last part, 21, chapter 21, verse 22, all the way through 22, verse 25. It keeps talking about who? The Lamb. The Lamb. The Lamb's the tabernacle. The Lamb's the light. The Lamb is the life. He's everything in that place. Amen. Everything. Exactly. Now let me tell you something. If God's going to end it up in that great crescendo, Joe, that the Lamb is everything, I believe the Lamb's been everything from the beginning. Don't you? Amen. Now here's the thing. Let me wind it up here. Let me look at the, turn to Revelation chapter 22. Now, verse 3. And there shall be no more curse. Oh, isn't that a glory? Amen. Now not just out there. In here. Exactly. Out there, yes. That'll be glorious too. But there'll be no more curse in here. Huh? And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. And that, I mean, we're going to be able to serve him with no more curse. And that, that, that's, I can't even, I, Joe, I can't even fathom what that's going to be like. But look, and they shall see his face. Huh? His face. Going to look at him. And you know what? He's a man. Yes, sir. You remember he talked to Abraham as a man talks with his friend. Yes, sir. That's what we're all going to experience one day. To be able to talk to the lamb face to face. You talk about a crescendo. Yes, sir. That's glorious. Yeah. I don't need a cloud and a harp if I got that, Joe. Exactly. Do it. It. Cloud and harp? Who needs that? Huh? Well, at least I won't go to hell. Then you've missed the Lamb, if that's all you're worried about is missing hell. Yeah. Uh-uh. Let me tell you, those who love the Lamb perfectly then, they still love Him even now. Yeah. Yes, sir. And you will be brought to love and adore and worship Him and serve Him even faultingly now, or you will never do so perfectly then. Yeah, that's, it. that's just the way it is. It ain't being mean. It ain't being hard. It's just the truth. Why? Because even in the beginning, God had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and his offering, what God did not have respect. It says here, look at it, verse 15, for without are, what? Dogs. Is he talking about canines? No. Talking about people. Yeah. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters. And whosoever loveth, maketh a lie. What does he say? Look at it. Drink. Are you thirsty? Drink. Yeah. He's the lamb. He's the life. He's the bread. He's the water. David, he's everything that we need. Amen. Isn't that glorious, Father? We pray that these things, this, no, this person, Lord, is real to us. That he's real to us. And that this is truly a God-given faith that lays hold of Christ through your free and sovereign mercy. Lord, these lips of clay cannot thank you adequately or enough, but yet we attempt, Lord, to thank you adequately and enough. For Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.